you have your Bibles, let's turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 28. We're going to start reading with verse number 18. And uh, you will find that this discourse happened in three of the four Gospels. It's called the Great Commission. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And we're apostolics. We know who the name of the Father is. It says, And teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Amen. God's with us always. Amen. I've used this scripture facetiously about t- talking about flying in airplanes that lo, God is with me. But God's with us everywhere. Even unto the end of the world. Amen. I want to talk to you for just a few minutes this morning about one single word out of this scripture. And that word is go. Go. Go, go. He didn't say stay. He didn't say sit. He said go. Lord, thank you for today for the spirit that's in your house. God, the presence that's here before the preaching of your word. I ask you, God, to touch each one of our hearts with a renewed commission. God, to place ourselves on your front line. Lord, you didn't call us to do great works of going around the world, but you said to some that they needed to stay and tell of the good things that God had done for them right in their own neighborhood, right in the midst of their own family, right where they were living. I ask you, God, here today to cause us to be stirred on the innermost man God, that we share with these lips what you have done for us. And I give you the thanks for what's about to happen in the city of Dublin in Jesus' name. God bless you. You may be seated this morning. I'm reading also from the book of Mark, chapter number 16 and verse number 14. It says, And afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. Now, you're talking about some people who had been with Jesus for three and a half years. You're talking about some people who were not just disciples. These were his apostles. These were folks that had been around and knew everything that Jesus had done. And if they weren't there in person, they got a firsthand account of what Jesus had done. And, and, and Jesus upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. Now, he, he hadn't been gone three days, and he said they already have a hard heart. And uh, there are times whenever it seems like I can, I can just have to deal with this thing this human heart of mine and it seems like it just takes a little bit of time to get to the place where you've got a soft and tender heart for God to the place where it becomes hard it says because they believe not them which had seen him after he was risen and he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover." And so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth. Amen. They went forth. I said they went forth. 
and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. You know, here's our problem is that we go out and we think that we're doing all the work. Amen. All God asked is for us to open up our mouth. Amen. And when we open up our mouth and speak about him, the Lord works with us, confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Hallelujah. He said, go. He said, preach. Matthew said, go and teach. Amen. And we have an, a commission from God that theologians have called the Great Commission that God is looking for out of not just the ministry. Both of these portions of scriptures were not written solely to the apostles. If they were, it would have been, an, it would have been a gross neglectful statement to say that it was only for 12. Luke 24, verse number 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Amen. You need to understand the Old Testament. What we call the Old Testament is still relevant for today. Amen. You can find Jesus in all of the law of Moses. Amen. He's in the tabernacle, but he's also in the offerings. He's in Genesis, amen, as, our, as a sign, amen, and the one that the woman would bruise his head. Amen. Excuse me, that it was spoken about that there would be enmity between the serpent and the woman. Amen. He is in the prophets, amen, mightily through the book of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and some of the minor prophets. Amen. And he is in the Psalms. Amen. And you can find him throughout the pages of the Word of God. They are a schoolmaster, Paul said, to bring us to Christ. Amen. Next verse, please. Then opened he their understanding. And that's a key. God needs to open our understanding today. Amen. God needs to give us a little bit of a revelation. Amen, if you please, that we might understand the scriptures. And said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Amen. Three different accounts of the last words of Jesus Christ before he left this world and ascended to heaven. All three teach, and teach us that we need to go, that we need to preach, that we need to teach all nations, all creatures, all individuals on the face of this earth about repentance about baptism, amen, and about this thing called the Holy Ghost, amen, which was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Amen. They were told to go back to Jerusalem and wait for a supernatural enduing of power. They were told to wait for a promise of the Father, amen, and it goes back amen beyond John the Baptist you know John was the guy who came and he said repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand John told them now the axe is laid to the root of the trees amen God is cutting down the family tree amen that allowed only Abraham and his children to be a part of the kingdom of God that he was going to graft in a Gentile church a world a worldwide church into the family of God. Amen. And John said, the latches of his shoes I'm not worthy to stoop down and unloose. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. 
Amen. Jesus here telling his disciples that you need to go into all the world. That we have a commission and a responsibility. He said, you will be witnesses of me to this generation. I'm going to back up just a second to Luke 24, verse number 32. Not going to go into the whole discourse, but uh, Cleopas and a friend were leaving Jerusalem after the crucifixion. They were talking amongst themselves, and, and along drew up Jesus walking with them, only they didn't recognize him as Jesus. He, his identity was withheld from them. Amen. And they began to talk about the things that had just happened. After he had spent some time walking to their house and coming into their house, he revealed himself to Cleopas and his friend and, and, and then disappeared into the night. Verse 32 says, And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures. You see, there is something that happens when we begin to discuss Jesus one with another. There's something that happens when we begin to talk about Jesus. Amen. There's a natural inquisitiveness of God that he comes alongside to hear what we've got to say about him. You know, we have this thing in our natural flesh. When we hear somebody talking about us, we start to raise our ear over in that direction and listen to what everybody's trying to say about you and I. You do it, I do it, amen, we all do it. And even if you're not willing to say it, amen, and amen, we do it. Because we want to know what everybody else thinks about us. Jesus is very concerned about what we think about him. Amen. He's concerned enough that when we begin to tell and talk to people along the way, that he sends a burning into the hearts of those that we're talking to about the Lord Jesus Christ. He authenticates what we're saying to somebody because he cares about the testimony of his name. He cares what people think about him and he cares enough that he's willing to come alongside when we're testifying and witnessing to people of the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Every single time. You may not feel it, but sometimes you do. I love teaching home Bible studies because it's there one-on-one -on -one with somebody who is reaching out to God and is willing to look into the pages of the Word of God and not just accept what I have to say, but see, as the Berean church, see if these things are not so. Amen. You feel something come down and you feel an authenticity that comes because their heart is wanting to know about Jesus. Amen. Their hearts begin to burn. Their hearts begin to, uh, begin to have a sensation that lets them know this isn't just testimony about any normal person or being. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have a hard time believing that God will use us. But I've read to you three places in the scripture where God said that you are to go. Amen. And if he is going to send you and I, if he's going to give us the commission and the directive to go into the world, he's going to give you a backup. Amen. He's going to give you the, the authenticity to this world that God is still alive. Amen. That the word of the Lord is still true. That repentance in his name is still, amen, repentance is still his plan. That baptism is still a part of the plan of God. And that there's something else that comes alongside behind that called a Holy Ghost that will visit them whose hearts are perfect to Lord God. He said that this message needs to be taken and going out into all the world with and preach to every creature. Now, God didn't tell us to go to the Columbus Zoo and preach to the gorillas. That word creature does not mean all everything that creeps with life. 
It means everything that God's created to stand upright. It means all human kind on the face of this earth that we have a commission to go out and preach and reach. Amen. That means in your world, which today, right now, all of our worlds have connected. We've come together at First Apostolic Church of Dublin. We've come together on Iderman Road and meeting together as the family of God right now. But when you go home to your world, when you go home to the place that you live, you have got an obligation by the scriptures to share the word of the Lord with your neighbor. To share the word of the Lord with those that you purchase gasoline and groceries from. You've got an obligation that when you go to work, you are to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. The scripture tells us that this is what we do. This is what we are to do as the members of the body of Jesus Christ. And sometimes we take it upon ourselves and we blame ourselves because people don't come to the house of God. We don't see the fruit of what we try to do. And, and I, I tell you, there are a lot of people in this world that are not going to even give you the time of day. I've been door knocking on, 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 on doors in Georgia, cold canvassing. And a young convert full of the fire of God and knock on somebody's door and it's Saturday afternoon. And, uh, you know, Saturday afternoon means baseball in the summertime. And if you're in Atlanta, that means the Braves. And, and, and the person opened the door up and uh, said, yes. I said, well, I'm, I'm so-and-so. I'm from uh, uh, Atlanta West. And before I could finish that up, slam. The wind blew me back. If I'd had my nose one inch closer to the door, it'd have been flattened. And from the other side of the glass, I heard him scream, I'm watching the Braves game. And you know what that does to a young faith? It says people don't want it. Amen. Jesus didn't say go out one time and see if the people will like it. He didn't say just, just go out and see how it goes. He said, no, you go and you work. You go and you work. You go and you work. And when you go, I will work with you. Amen. You have no idea. You have no concept of what one moment, one time in time can do for somebody's soul. Amen. I, I was contacted as I was outreach director of Atlanta West Pentecostal Church for about five years. And I was contacted by a brother from another area of the country. And he said, I've got a brother that lives really close to your church. And would you please go visit him? He's having a hard time. Uh, finances aren't there. He's lost his job. His, his wife is, is getting ready to leave him because he can't keep a job. And, and, and all these bad negative things are happening. And he's never been in the door of a Pentecostal church. So with that information, I went. I knocked on his door. We, uh, there was another brother with us. We began to talk with him, and, and over the space of an hour, we shared the gospel with him, and we asked him about his, some of his needs, and, and uh, he said, I don't even have any food in the refrigerator. He opens up the refrigerator, and uh, just, God touched our heart. Without church money, we just went, both of us, the, this brother and I went down to the grocery store, got a couple bags of groceries, brought it back, and said, hey, brother, at least you're going to be able to eat for a little while, a couple of days anyhow. He, he consented to a Bible study and went through one lesson. One lesson. All of a sudden, he decided he was going to move back to the, to the hills of where he was from and uh, didn't hear anything about him for 12 years. Run into his brother again. His brother sings with a gospel group that's quite popular, an apostolic gospel group, and said, hey, how's your brother doing? And he said, you know what? He's my assistant pastor. He came back after that weekend talking to you, and he said he went outside one night and spent all night long in prayer in the holler. Got a hold of the horns of the altar. God filled him with the Holy Ghost. Nobody else was around. Amen. So whatever I did and sowed, 
Amen. What I thought was a failure, what I thought wasn't going to go anywhere, what I, did, what I thought was just another, uh, another ch- time that I had failed, God used that time, and today he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have no idea what you're going to do. You have no idea what, what you say to somebody is going to do in the future, but you do have the responsibility to go into all the world, to go everywhere and teach this gospel and preach this gospel to every creature. Well, brother, pastor, he's talking to the preachers here. No, he's talking to all of us. Amen. There's no way I can go into all this world. There's no way the ministry of the United Pentecostal Church can go into all this world. 7,000 or so, I think there's 8,000 licensed ministers, and we're all supposed to go across the 323 million Americans. No, that, that's a very, very, very slim chance of reaching the world. But if we can, together as the church, amen, learn to go outside of the doors of the house of God and bring this gospel to anybody that we look at, amen, not caring whether they're driving a Benz or if they don't have an automobile at all, not looking at the style of clothing that they wear, not caring if they come up out of the gutter because they spent the night there last night homeless because they didn't have a place to go home to. It doesn't matter what kind of social or economic strata people are from. Jesus said, go ye therefore into all of our world. Amen. Some of us have a noble idea that, yeah, we'll go and we'll, we'll be ready to pack up and go around the world to Pakistan or, or, or India or someplace, Brazil. Jesus didn't tell everybody to go around the world. He called special apostles to do that. Amen. Mark chapter 1, verse number 40. It says, And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him. And saith unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. And he straightly charged him, and forthwith sent him away. And he saith unto him, See thou sayeth nothing to say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Amen. And verse number 45 says, But he went out and began to publish it much and blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, this leper's hometown, but was wet without in desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. You know, perhaps we ought to tell you not to say anything about God. Perhaps Jesus was using some reverse psychology on this leper, saying, you're, you're going to get healed, but don't tell anybody about it. I know this, I, I, I've been a kid, and I, I'm now a parent, and I know that that word no sometimes doesn't enter into kids' ears. You say no, they interpret it as yes. It just... I don't know what happens between this ear and that ear, but the no becomes yes. I'm not trying to embarrass my kids. They're good kids. But that's how it is. Sometimes whenever we're told not to do something, that's the very thing that begins to burn on the inside of us. It begins to boil over, and we've got to tell somebody. Amen. When somebody's got a secret, amen, it's kind of hard to contain, especially when it's a good one like this, that, hey, look at me. I was a leper. I was sentenced to that colony outside. I wasn't allowed to come into the city, amen, but Jesus touched me, and here I am today. I'm clean. I don't have any blemishes. There's, uh, he has made me completely whole. Amen. He didn't send the leper around the world. He came back to his own city. He came back to the people who knew him. He came back to the people who had known that he was a part of that group of people that were unclean and were not allowed in the city because of the contamination they could have brought. 
Oh, my God. We've got to work our city. Amen. This must not have been just a one-time thing because if you look at Mark chapter 3, verse number 9, and he spake to his disciples that, that a small ship should wait upon him because of the multitude, lest they should, see, lest they should throng him. For he had healed many insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him as many as had plagues. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. Amen. He told those people who had been healed by the multitudes that you need to keep this quiet. You need to keep this to yourself. Amen. I can't, for the love of God, think why Jesus would tell them that except that that would make them want to all the more spread the good news around. Amen. All the more to let people know that there is a man that is walking in the, our city that has the power over unclean spirits. He has the power over every affliction and every disease, every part of, of nature. Amen. And Jesus said, don't let it be known. It's a paradox. But maybe that's what inflamed them to let him know. And he couldn't, he couldn't minister. He said, get a boat ready so that they can rescue me out of this throng. Mark 7, verse 33, And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears, and he spit and touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and saith unto them, Ephaphtha, that is, be opened. And straightway his ears were opened, and the string of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plain. And he charged them that they should tell no man. But the more he charged them, so much more the great deal they published it. Amen. Here they were. The deaf man is completely restored and his speech is given back to him. I don't know if you've noticed it, but a lot of times when you have a deaf person, they call them a deaf mute. They don't have the ability to speak plainly. This is that kind of person here. They said that it was such that in their understanding, he had a string wrapped around his tongue. Couldn't talk right. Couldn't talk straight. Amen. And when he healed him, he had to tell everybody around about him, don't tell anybody else. But the more he charged them, so much the more they made a great deal and published it. Amen. And they were beyond measure astonished, saying, he hath done all things well. He maketh both the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. I want to tell you something. Maybe we ought to sit back and tell you not to, to keep this gospel to yourself. Amen. Maybe we ought to sit back and say, it's illegal for you to go out and tell anybody about Jesus and wait until this thing begins to boil and bubble inside of your soul until there's nothing else, amen, that can constrain you and you got to go and tell somebody about the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mark's, Mark 9 and 7, it says, There was a cloud that overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. And suddenly when they had looked round about, they saw no man anymore save Jesus only with themselves. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. So here we have again a fourth example of Jesus saying, don't tell what you have seen. Don't you dare share with anybody else what you have seen here in the mountain this day. I want to tell you something. Maybe it was reverse psychology, but it is the will of God for us to go into all of our world, to go to our our neighbors, to go to our friends, to go to those who live around about us, to go to those that work and share this gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Amen. We have some that believe that the word go here means that you need to just leave everything behind and go where God tells you to go. It's not exactly the will of God. There are missionaries. 
I know I've been in Atlanta. I've felt the call of God, and we packed up everything we had and to one little old U of all truck and went to Washington, D.C., and not knowing a soul, not having any family within 500 miles, began to forge a home missions work on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. I know it was the call of God. There was nothing about me that wanted to leave a cush job, a lifetime job, go to an area I didn't know anybody, and start all over again working for God. I know it was a call, but God just doesn't give that to everybody. Mark chapter 5, verse number 15, and I skipped over this, sister, I apologize. It says, and they came to Jesus, and seeing him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion, sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was come to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends. And tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish it in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. You see, not everybody's intended to go around the world and go to someplace else. God intends for the bulk of us and the majority of us to stay right where we're at. Amen. Right in your neighborhood, there's somebody. I, I, I'll say this in the word of the Lord. Right next to somebody in this building is somebody who's been crying out, God, please show me your way. Right next to somebody is somebody who's crying out to God, asking God to show them how they can get their life out of the horrible mess that it is in. Amen. God took me from, uh, from Dayton, Ohio, and dropped me down on the west side of Atlanta. And I had been praying. God had gotten a hold of my life uh, over the last year. And I'd been praying, God, I need to get out of the mess that I'm making out of my life. God took me out of Ohio and dropped me right next door, a duplex apartment right next door to a Holy Ghost-filled, Jesus-named baptized family. Amen. God heard my cry and my prayer. And because there wasn't anybody here in Ohio that was going to come and, and visit me, he put me right next door to somebody. Who, who knew the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I will tell you that there are people in your life right next to you, somewhere in your neighborhood that are ready, prepared by God. We need to start praying, God, show us who's ready. Show us to the people who, are, who you're working with. Show us to those who are ready to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ because they are there. They're being prepared for us. Amen. And God is intending us who have received the healing us who have received the gospel of Jesus Christ, us whose lives are walking with the Lord. He's looking for us to reach out and find those who he's preparing to receive the gospel. Amen. I was burdened this week, and I'm beginning to close. Sister, were you able to get that picture? Amen. I think it was Thursday morning. My wife got to the church a few minutes before I did and uh, on the, I guess the west side of the church entrance, this fuzzy little mouse was all camped out there by the door. You can hardly see it, but the door is to the far left of the picture. You can see the door frame in brown and you can see Mr. Mouse, he's all curled up there eight inches away from warmth and safety. My wife thought that he was going to just sit there and wait to scurry in, so she waited for me to get to the church so that I could <laughs> scare him off. And uh, 
I walked up and I stamped my feet a couple times and he didn't budge. I, I realized he'd froze to death right there at the threshold to heat and safety. If you look down the hallway from this end, from the inside out, you'll see that to the left, that left-hand portion of uh, the door there, there's a little tiny hole in the weather stripping. And so he must have come there and felt the warmth blowing out of the house of God and decided he was going to camp out there. And he, more than likely he was emaciated and hadn't eaten very well because it didn't get that cold that night, the night before. It was only like 28 degrees. That's not terrible, but it was enough for him to come and get that close and freeze to death. I looked at him, his furry little body there. He had red eyes, and uh, you know, my heart just started to go to him. He died on the threshold of the house of God. And then the Lord just spoke to me like God always seems to do. Amen. He said, you can have pity on that little mouse. But within five miles of this threshold, there are 60,000 human beings that are in a cold, cold, dark world that don't have the kind of food that's going to keep them saved and keep them alive. There's 60,000 souls round about that are lost, amen, and are going to be just as dead as this mouse is if we don't reach them, amen. It turned a moment of t cute tenderness into a bunch of tears in an altar, amen. And th that's the way we are sometimes, and I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty. I, 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 I love animals, uh, I, can, I can get teary-eyed about animal stories, and uh, I've got a message one day, I may, may or may not preach here, but uh, about dogs. and what, The more I know about some dogs, the less I think about some people. There's a couple chihuahuas about six, seven years ago that a family had, and they were out in Alaska doing some trails, and uh, a grizzly bear come out of the forest after the family and those two chihuahuas went to battle for, for their owner they got mauled, tore up hacked in pieces and killed by a grizzly bear but their selfless act allowed them allowed their owners to crawl to safety and were saved from the attack of the grizzly bear what kind of love does a dog have for his master that it would give its life to be horribly dismembered and tore up by a grizz so that his owner, man's best friend, could be saved? We can shed a tear and we can, we can get all fuzzy, get that warm fuzzy feeling down on the inside about a good story like that, but what about our neighbor? who's just outside, within five miles, 60,000 people who come home at night don't know how they're going to live and how they're going to make ends meet next month. Facing foreclosure, facing a job that gave them a pink slip, facing a wife or a husband who has given them a bill of divorcement, facing alcoholism, drugs, heroin, their life is horribly tore up and the only thing they can do is hope that somebody will go to them and will open their mouth and speak words of hope so that they can be saved. Church, I want to go. I want to go. I can't go to Pakistan. I'm not called there. I can't go to South America, Africa. I'm called here. Amen. And I want to go. I want to touch every her person, every household, every threshold in the city of Dublin. 
within five miles, Plain City, Jerome, and Dublin have over 60,000 souls waiting for you and I. Plus, some of you live further out. And they may never darken the door of this church. But you can have a home Bible study with them and see the burning feeling of Jesus' love touch somebody else. Warm them up and not let them freeze to death at the threshold of the house of God. Amen. That's our shared responsibility. Amen. So as I close, I'm going to ask you to all stand. And begin to take a spiritual account of the effort and the energy you've put into sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with your neighbors, co-workers, and friends. Amen. Some people are a instantaneous harvest I pray that God leads me to a live wire who will hear the word come to the house of God and will lay him over in the water in Jesus name some people are like a walnut tree you plant that seed and it's, a, it's nine months before anything starts to happen everything in between I want to see with God's eyes I may have shared this with you I'm going to share it again if I have with that brother who I landed next door to in the duplex I left Ohio with my best friend thought we'd both make a new life down in Georgia when they knew we were moving in they began to pray you see Chris was a fairly decent looking young man had his hair cut right he, he had a few vices but he didn't have the vices I had my hair was to my waist my speech was not seasoned with salt and they began to pray that I would go away so that God would save him in the wisdom of God the opposite happened I'm here today in spite somebody praying for me to leave What does that mean, Pastor? What I'm saying to you today is that you can't look on the outside and see what God's going to do. You can walk by the person who's in the gutter, vomit on top of them from a, a night of alcohol the night before. You can't see what God sees. You can look at somebody and they may look like they're the wildest individual and the furthest from God. But what Bud and Peg didn't understand is that underneath all of the exterior, there was a heart that had been longing for God for a long time. There was a grandmother who'd been praying for my soul for many, many years. Amen. And God placed me there to fulfill a promise to a lady who would go on before I got down there to be with the Lord and had to honor her prayer. Amen. Right outside of your doors. I'll guarantee you, every one of you, there's somebody God's working on already. There's somebody, even if you live out in the rural sections, amen, there's somebody close to your house that you run into. Amen, I'll guarantee you God's working them over double time in their heart because he wants to have a harvest. Amen, and he's told you, go, go. 
go. Teach. Preach. Amen, young people. There's somebody in your school that if you'll just reach out to, if you'll just open up and speak some words, there'll be somebody here to get the Holy Ghost. The enemy is not going to tell you to share Jesus with anybody. As a young convert, I, I asked the pastor, I said, I, I, I just feel jittery and feel like God wants me to tell somebody at times about the Lord. And he said, So if you feel impressed, step out in faith. If you feel the tug of your heart to tell somebody about Jesus and tell them about a revival, we're going to have a good time. Amen. Why not share it with somebody else? You know, you ladies, if you find a good deal at Walmart or Target or wherever, you're burning that phone up telling everybody else, hey, those, it's on sale over there. Go get it. Go get it. There's something better than the best blue light special. There's something better than the best deal you can get at this grocery store, at the discount store, at the department store, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. I, I want to burn up the phone lines till people get tired of hearing about it. But I don't want to offend them, Pastor. I don't want to offend them. I'd rather offend somebody than send them to hell by not sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd rather tell somebody they need God than face them in front of Jesus Christ as court is in session at the great white throne and them ask me, why didn't you tell me about Jesus Christ? I'd rather tell them and let them reject it than suffer the guilt and the pain of knowing I could have made a difference but I was too busy or too concerned about what somebody else would think or in all honesty just didn't care enough to tell them about Jesus. Praise God. I'm going to leave it at this and I'm going to ask God to gnaw at your heart with the word of the Lord. Church, Easter's coming up in a couple weekends, three weekends, I think. Four. It's coming up soon. It is the time traditionally when you can get people to come to church they may give you a no for other services, but something tugs on their heart about Easter. Let's see every chair fill. Let's see every part of this house being utilized for the kingdom of God and so winning for Easter Sunday. Amen. May the word of the Lord convict you. And may we go our world and our city and teach and preach every creature praise God if you want to continue to pray you're welcome to pray if you need to be dismissed you're dismissed in Jesus name